Hey, it's Rick Kettner here, and in this video, I wanna share three insights from my favorite marketing book of all time, The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing by Al Reese and Jack Trout. This book is an absolute classic. It came out back in 1994, and even though a lot of the examples in the book are dated at this point, the core ideas, the fundamental insights in this book are as relevant as ever. This book is about brand positioning, and marketing strategy. So if you're trying to establish a global brand, a niche brand, a local brand, or even just a personal brand, the ideas in this book can help you achieve those things more easily. Before I actually jump into my favorite insights from the book, I just wanna ask you, do you have a favorite business or marketing book that you think I should cover here on the channel in the future? Let me know down in the comment section below. I'm always interested to hear about new and interesting books. So definitely let me know in the comment section. And if you wanna learn more about business, marketing or entrepreneurship, I recommend that you subscribe to the channel here on YouTube and that you turn on notifications. That way you won't miss out on future videos. But let's get into it. The three insights that I wanna cover in this video coincide with three of the laws from the book. So I'm gonna be covering law number one, law number two, and we're gonna jump down to law number nine. Starting with law number one, the law of leadership. When it comes to becoming a leading brand in a specific category, the way they describe it in the book is that it's better to be first than it is to be better. So it's better to be the first brand to establish yourself with customers within a given category than it is to come along later and try to convince people at that point that you have a superior product. And the reason for this is interesting because the way our minds work, the way our brains work, is we make associations between things. We're always creating relationships between different things in the world and the way that we think about them. And when it comes to brands and businesses and then the product categories that they're in, we make these connections and typically we don't like to change the connections after they're made. So when we think of a specific product category, we tend to think of a specific brand that we consider to be the leader in that category. And as the law suggests, the first brand to kind of take that position is very difficult to displace. So let me give you a few examples of this. this is, these are examples that I provide often here on the channel whenever I'm talking about this. So forgive me if you've already heard these, but let me quickly run through these. When you think of coffee shops, most people's minds immediately go to Starbucks. Fast food, it's McDonald's. Electric cars, Tesla. Streaming television, Netflix. Ride sharing, Uber. Painkillers, Tylenol. You get the idea, and with all of these examples, what they tend to have in common is these are the brands that were first able to establish themselves within the minds of their target audience. And that's a really important point. It's not just a matter of being the very first to ever come out with a specific product or a specific service. It's about being the first business to make a connection to get into the minds of your target audience, whoever that target audience might be. It might be a global audience, as with a number of these examples here, or it could just be a local audience. It could be within your niche audience. It really depends on who your target audience is. But the point is, you want to be first to create that connection between your product category, whether it's within a niche or a global audience, and within your brand. So people are connecting the category to your brand. Now, the most common question that comes up whenever I'm talking about this with people, or even when I originally read the book, when I'm reading through this law, the question that came up was, what do you do if you're not first? What do you do if you're coming into the category later in the game and there's already an established brand that is clearly established within the market, people already think of them as the leader in the category, what are you supposed to do then? Because what a lot of people tend to do is they try to beat the competition, right? And again, the point is it's better to be first than it is to be better. It's very, very difficult to displace the leader. That's where we move on to law number two, the law of the category. If you're not first in a category, the best option available to you is to create a new category that you can be first in. And typically what you wanna do is you wanna create a new category based on the strengths of your business, whatever it is that you do differently from the leader in the previous category. And if you can create a brand new category and if you can establish and promote that category to customers, they're typically open to making a new connection. They no longer associate that with the previous category. It's a new category and they're ready to make a connection between that category and a new brand. But it's really important that this category is different enough from the previous category that they don't confuse the two. Really, really important there. But I'll give you a few examples of this. McDonald's owns fast food. So if you were gonna enter the space, you might go after gourmet fast food, healthy fast food, Mexican fast food. You can niche down, so to speak. You can go for a smaller subcategory. That's what a lot of people do with great success. Another option, and my preferred option, the option I'd recommend to you, is to seek a category that is likely to eventually overtake 
the established category. So look at what is currently happening and to see if you can predict a category that's eventually gonna overtake that category, allowing you to own that category and eventually become the dominant leader overall. So a great example of this is if we look at the history of social networks. Way back in the day, MySpace was the number one brand in social networks. I wouldn't say they went completely mainstream, but they were the strongest brand when it came to social networks. Facebook came along and they redefined the category. Whether this was intentional strategy or not, they took the approach of focused on, focusing on real identities. So as opposed to the anonymous approach of MySpace, where some people were using their names, many people weren't, Facebook came along and they focused on college campuses initially. Everybody on the network was using their real name, their real identity. These were real relationships, many of them in real life relationships where there were actually people that you knew in person at the time, even though I'd say that's kind of shifted now where a lot of people connect with people online they may not have an in real life relationship with, but they shifted the strategy and they created this new category of real identities. And of course, as history has shown, that proved to be a more popular approach to doing social networking. So Facebook actually overtook MySpace by defining a new category and history almost repeated itself. In fact, I would argue it did repeat itself, but Mark Zuckerberg played it pretty smart. He set out, well, so I should explain, Instagram, they re redefined the social network game again. Instagram came along and at the time, Facebook was almost exclusively used from a web browser. So either on a laptop, a desktop computer, that is how everybody used Facebook at the time. Instagram came out with a mobile first approach. Their social network was entirely based on being accessible on mobile. In fact, they took advantage of the camera on the brand new iPhone and they focused on a mobile approach. Even to this day, their web experience is pretty lackluster. They started on iPhone, they eventually added Android, but it's always kind of been a mobile focused social network. And so this was a paradigm shift. This was a new category. It played into the strengths of Instagram and their technology, leveraging the camera and that sort of thing. And Mark Zuckerberg recognized that the future of social was mobile. This was the new category that would eventually supplant what Facebook was doing at the time. And so he pivoted Facebook hard to take a mobile first approach moving forward. I remember this being a really big thing. Everything at the company was now shifting over to focus on mobile. And of course he bought Instagram for a billion dollars, which at the time was considered a ridiculous purchase. It was mocked openly. And now today, a lot of people consider it one of the best, if not the best acquisition in all of tech history to date. So this move was entirely based on the fact, in my opinion, my understanding of this, and based on the ideas from this book, on the fact that Instagram was redefining the social network category. Not just that they were growing rapidly, but because they were actually redefining the category and their category was likely to overtake Facebook's category. So that's kind of the approach I would recommend is to look for a paradigm shift, look for an opportunity to create a category based on the strengths of whatever it is that you do that is likely to overtake the category if you're not the leader in the current category. One little warning around this though, and I think I mentioned this earlier, just be sure that you pick a category that is different enough. Snapchat tried to have history repeat itself again. They tried to reinvent the modern social network and they used self-destructing messages, filters, lenses, some new approaches to social media. Unfortunately, they weren't different enough. They didn't create a truly different category. And so Instagram was able to borrow those features, integrate them into Instagram, and the rest is history. Instagram maintained their position. Snapchat has had some success, but Instagram continues to be the dominant player in the mobile first approach to social networking, along with Facebook. I mean, Facebook has benefited heavily from the fact that they acquired Instagram and they pivoted really quickly, but Snapchat was not different enough to really leverage their fresh approach to social networking. Let's move on to the third insight, which we're jumping down to law number nine, the law of the opposite. This is another way to solve the same problem, a different approach, but another way to solve the problem if you're not the market leader. So the idea here is that in most categories, there is room for a strong second brand to have success. Typically beyond that, it really waters down heavily, but there's usually a number one, and then there's a decent number two, and then three down through 10 tend to be pretty weak overall. And the idea here is if you wanna be a strong number two in a category, you have to base your strategy on what the leader is doing. So the law of the opposite, you wanna be the opposite, because generally speaking, there are two kinds of customers in any given category. There are the people that wanna buy from the leader and there are the people that do not want to buy from the leader. And you want to appeal to that second group. This is how the book explains it. You wanna focus on that second group because 
For whatever reason, they do not want to buy from the leader, probably because they either do not want what the leader is offering, or maybe they're you know, channeling their inner rebel and they just want to do something different. They just do not want to buy from the big brand. And so whatever the reason may be, you want to focus on serving these people. The kinds of brands that try to emulate the leader and try to outperform the leader and try to replace the leader, these are the brands that typically fall down the list to positions three through 10. They're just a cheap knockoff of the leader, as, at least as far as consumers are concerned. Again, it might be a superior product, but people do not care. They, they see the leader as being the number one brand. They aren't really interested in somebody else that's coming along saying, hey, we do it better. They don't care. They still consider the leader the leader. But if there's a clear alternative, if there's a different approach, then they're open to that, especially people that do not want to buy from the leader for whatever reason. So it often pays to actually unite people that do not like the leading brand. If you look at how Samsung has handled their marketing with Apple, Perfect example of this, right? Samsung in their ads, they openly mock Apple customers. And believe me, this is not an attempt for them to win them over and to get them, to convince them to buy uh, Samsung Galaxy phones. The idea here is they wanna unite people that do not like Apple. They want everybody that dislikes Apple to be on their team. And so now the battle between iOS and Android has become the battle between the iPhone and Samsung Galaxy phones. And this is because they presented themselves as the alternative They've done things like larger screen devices a lot earlier than Apple did. They offer more selections, whereas Apple's lineup is really minimalist. They give you a few different options. Samsung has way more hardware options. When it comes to software customization, they use Android and they have a lot more customization options. They maintained the headphone jack even when Apple removed it. They've intentionally, for a number of reasons over the years, separated themselves and did things that Apple was not willing to do. They've positioned themselves as the opposite, the alternative. And What's interesting is this is another example of history repeating itself. If you go back to the mid 90s, I think it was, Apple was in the same position with Microsoft. Microsoft was the dominant brand in personal computers and Apple came along with their ad campaign around I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. And they, I don't think they mocked PC customers, but they mocked PCs, they mocked Microsoft. They mocked the idea of the boring beige box and instead they promoted Apple and their Mac as the clear alternative. And again, they had no illusions that they were gonna take over the marketplace. They were gonna somehow surpass Microsoft. They just presented themselves as the clear alternative. So that is another really viable strategy. You can either create a new category or you can position yourself as a strong number two by being the opposite, by being the alternative brand. So those are three of my favorite insights from the book. There's obviously a lot more to the book. We didn't touch on the law of focus, the law of line extension, or any of the many other laws in the book. But if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, if you're a marketer, if you're into business strategy, I highly recommend that you read this book. It's a relatively short read and it will be definitely be worth your time. If you enjoyed this video, if you got anything out of it, please click the like button down below to let me know. It also helps promote this channel and grow our audience, so I really appreciate that. And if you're interested in learning more about business, marketing, or entrepreneurship, I recommend that you subscribe to the channel here on YouTube and that you turn on notifications. That way, you won't miss out on future videos. If you have any questions about the book or if you have a recommendation for a book that I should cover here in the future, let me know down in the comment section below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.